Welcome to the Bear Hug Experience, where we cozy up to the fire in our digital den and immerse ourselves in the inspiration born from exploring the hidden narratives and inevitable plot twists that shape every compelling startup journey. Join us as we showcase inspirational guests from bold investors with the Midas touch to pioneering entrepreneurs at the helm of today's most thrilling startups. We'll also hear from courageous go-to-market leaders navigating the frontier of emerging tech and the unsung heroes bringing all the people and parts together to form unstoppable dream teams. Here's your host, Craig Ward, founder and managing director of Bear Hug Recruiting. Get ready for an insightful journey. The following is a conversation with Jay Potter, a brilliant entrepreneur who so far has personally raised more than $150 million, taken 11 companies public, three of which were his own creation, and he's been a trailblazer in the environmental technology movement for decades. He and the teams he's been central to are responsible for introducing numerous groundbreaking inventions to the world such as developing the first high-volume electrolysis for hydrogen and non-toxic disinfectants, the world's first solar parking array, the first industrial pellet plant in the U.S., and today he serves as the CEO of Ecor Global, a company that is converting agricultural and urban waste into sustainable building materials, providing a cleaner future for us all. Welcome to the Bear Hug Experience. And now, dear friends, fellow entrepreneurs, investors, and startup enthusiasts, here is Jay Potter. All right, Jay Potter, really excited for this and can't wait to hear all about your story. So thanks for coming on the show. You betcha. How are you feeling coming into this today? As one of the first podcasts, I've done interviews before, but never a podcast. It's a different type of pressure. Different type of pressure, positive pressure, hopefully. Yeah, it's, no, it's like, you know, you want to do it right. You know, I don't know who's going to be listening to this. Yeah. So, I, and these, in this day and age with, with everybody taking stuff out of context, you can only one, imagine what could happen. <laughs> well, I'm going to be taking things out of context and slicing and dicing <laughs> this and putting it all over the internet. So we'll have to see how people interpret that. Yeah. Why don't we start by having you tell our listeners what you're up to these days? Well, Briefly. the same thing I've been doing for quite some time, which is which is building innovative environmental technology companies, you know, trying to make a difference and trying to make a buck. So today, the primary focus is on a company called Ecor Global. Ecor, uh, I refer to it as a 15-year overnight success, but it's actually been even longer than that now. And what we have uh, been trying to do is what many before us have failed in accomplishing and that is come up with a better composite material, something like an MDF or HDF or plywood that isn't made with petrochemicals and so that it is recyclable. You know, some of your listeners will have heard of what's called the circular economy, which is really about a focus on mitigating climate and resource scarcity. You know, because of the number of people we have, the growing population, middle class, product demand is resource demand. And as a function of that, we don't have nearly enough trees to manage the, that demand. And of course, our trees are greatest tool against CO2. So we're coming up with an alternative product that comes from the agricultural waste and urban waste. And it's taken a long time to get here, but we've, uh, we've done it. And in one sentence, what are you, one or two sentences, what are you hoping to do with this? If you just kind of paint me a quick picture of the future. Well, the the greatest impact of the future is that we have a technology that can be built. It's modular, so it can be built anywhere and would without question be the only path from a resource and cost economic perspective of providing for world housing. Okay. There's a lot of people without houses, right? So not to mention there's a lot of products that are made with, and building materials that are made with wood that need to have a substitute, an alternative. And we are that alternative. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. So it's a pretty audacious goal. Tell me what is your superpower that 
allows you to take on such an audacious project? Oh, I don't know. My inability to lose, my inability to accept loss, my I guess my ability to withstand negative, unforeseen, you know, events and find a path, find a solution, find a, find the ability to withstand and overcome. Boil that down to one word if you had to give your superpower one single word. Optimism. To label it. Optimism. Okay, I can see how that would have to be present for this. <laughs> every, so every, on the flip There's no such thing. I mean, every entrepreneur since the beginning of time that says, I have an idea that does not exist. In other words, a, you know, that I call it a BGO, the blinding glimpse of the obvious, you know, mm -hmm. where someone says, holy crap, that's something that, that this world needs. It doesn't exist. And they just have the courage to say, I'm going to, I'm going to make that a reality. That first moment is pure optimism, right? Right. And that's something that they have to maintain or that product or service or whatever that absence that is identified will never exist. I mean, every right. entrepreneur goes into every single startup with nothing but optimism, unfortunately. And, and of course, the probably the best line Mike Tyson ever came up with in his entire life. And it probably wasn't him, his, but you know, that, that phrase, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Yep. You know, that rings bells. Well, on the flip side of the superpower conversation, if we think about the things that wear you down or suck your energy while you're on this path, or the one thing that you could refer to as your kryptonite, what have you encountered that is sort of the antithesis well, it would be, of... It, it would, it, it's the other side of that same coin. It's the pessimism. And with the pessimism comes the, you know, people drama, you know, complaints. I, uh, that's one thing I've never been able to manage well is bickering, you know, inner team, you know, uh, perceived mm -hmm. inequalities, insecurities. I mean, we all have them, but if is, and as long as we face them and ask for help, you know, admit where we're weak, then that, that's okay. It's when it becomes pettiness, when it becomes a defensive element is when you, when communication breaks down. And with that, when communication breaks down in a small company, everything breaks down. Right. So not only internally within the team, but there's probably also pessimism in the market about it's not worth it or just like habitual oh, like, ways I, I, of doing I'll things. Give you a, I'll give you a perfect example today. So, you know, I've been blessed to be at the very start of a lot of different technologies. You know, one of them is related to electric vehicle charging. So mm -hmm. in, you know, 2000, shoot, I guess maybe 10, 11 we were making a lot of noise with respect to the need for solar power and electric vehicle charging. And we were predicting the electric vehicle would dominate. And the funny thing is, is that it's happened. But right now, right now in the press, the number one thing in the press right now is, and it's been an ongoing battle, right? There's still this huge contingent that wants the internal combustion engine to have a, a reason for existence, which it will be here for another 30 years in one form or another. It's just less efficient. But now all the news is that the bloom is off the rose and that slow that there's a massive slowdown in electric vehicle car purchases. <laughs> well, they're not telling yeah. you the whole story. There's a whole slowdown in all automobile purchases because interest rates have changed and there's a slowdown in the economy or perceived slowdown in the economy. Right? Right. So it brings out all that negativity. And that is definitely something that every entrepreneur, especially those that are raising capital, it's a horror show. It's awful because you're fighting a ghost. You're fighting a, an invisible mm. opponent. It doesn't have any shape or form. It's fear. Yeah. Yeah. No, I saw those earning reports. It's all people forecasting the future who don't know. There's a lot of factors that you can't control. And overall, things might actually be going great, but it's people's perspective and then the headlines that can like torpedo the yeah. progress oftentimes. I mean, for the last two years, we've been hearing about this incredible recession, and yet it doesn't make itself apparent. And we keep being surprised by our continued growth. Well, why can't yep. we just continue to grow, but at a controlled pace? Yep. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to transition us to a question to help set you up a bit. And I want to do something that's kind of fun, but may catch you a bit off guard. Are you ready? Oh. 
<laughs> All right. I'm going to do what I ask every candidate that I recruit to do when I first reach out and begin talking to them. And I typically do it in the first couple of minutes and it always surprises everybody. And it's, they, they all think it's fun, but it's a bit of a curveball. I always ask them to tell me their whole life story within a five minute time cap, just because I love to see one, how people respond to it, two, what they choose to share, because it's a scramble. And three, I'd like to see how people manage what I hope is a healthy stress of self-imposed time caps. So can you take a quick look at the time and hold yourself to your own five minute time cap and sure. do that? Not a problem. <laughs> All right. I'm looking at my clock too. Whenever you're ready, go. My whole life story in five minutes. I grew yep. up in Goleta, which is just north of Santa Barbara. My backyard was about 3 million acres, um, which is basically the entire Pacific coastline to the mountains, all the way from Santa Barbara to Lompoc. It was incredible. I, I wish kids could have that kind of opportunity today. From there, I grew up in a upper middle class family. My father, although I did not know it until much later in life, my father was one of our country's top engineers. He literally was a one of our first um, well, he did all the lunar, he did all the trajectory work for the lunar lander, which be, meant he used a slide rule, not a computer. Brilliant individual. I wrestled in high school, football in high school, tried to make my father proud and to go be an engineer in college, in, as an aeronautical engineer. About in my thir late fourth year, fluid dynamics, second year, I knew I wasn't going to be a good engineer. I still plowed through. My dad introduced me to Kent Cressa, who is the CEO of uh, Northrop, who told me, go sell something. I guess I need to back up. I, ever since I was 15, I've, started, I've had my own companies selling either yeah. aeration, which I had a whole crew. I brought that to uh, San Diego when I went to school. That paid for everything. Always had money, which was a different thing than most. From there, went and took my first job which was selling high-end switch equipment. I was the youngest by probably 25 years. Why I did that, I was fascinated by the new techno telecom technologies. I left that, became a, a broker for a commodities firm of about 500 guys, and in a year was the top broker in the, in the enterprise. From there, got sucked into an oil and gas operation out of L.A., half criminals, realize they hmm. need their help to drill a dry hole or even actually have a real well. From there, started my own oil and gas company, I drilled hundreds of wells, bought tens of thousands of acres of land. I uh, had a great business. My wife still reminds me of, that's when we had money or at least a lot of it. Transitioned that into, had a lunch with a gentleman named Ray Anderson. From there, became enamored with the environment and what has to happen. From there, opened up, used my firm and started changing, reverting people from investing in gambling on oil to gambling on the environment and environmental technologies. I've done a bunch of firsts. We built the first hydrogen operation from electrolysis, high volume. We did the first solar parking array. We did the first industrial pellet plant. We've done a lot of things, all leading to where we are today, which is Ecor Global, which is the conversion of waste streams into building materials. I brushed over a, a half a dozen companies along the way. I've taken 11 companies public. I've been the CEO of three of them. I'm a lot smarter today than I was then. I think, I, I think that would cover. I married two kids. Uh, incredible kids, strong wife, bright future. That would be five minutes now. The only thing you left out is your favorite flavor of ice cream. So <laughs> I didn't touch on golf. I didn't touch on a half a dozen things I can think of now. I know five, five minutes, you can only pack so much in. So I have all sorts of things I'm curious to dig into from that. And that's what's so fun, right? So it sounds like to me, um, a very big influence in your life was your father. You had mentioned when you were growing up, you didn't realize how impactful his work was in the world. Obviously, you wanted to follow in his footsteps as uh, you said, aeronautical engineer. 
But tell me more about your father and how that impacted and influenced and shaped your perspective on the world. Well, my dad was an engineer's engineer, right? So again, you don't, I don't think you deal with that many engineers, but they're not braggarts. So, and also certainly, you know, my dad had some of the highest security clearances known to man. So, you know, there wasn't a lot of sharing of what did you do today at work, dad? That was not that. And again, some of your listeners will identify with that because they can't share. It's not something that they get to, they can't bring their work home with them. In fact, until I was 13, I thought everybody's dad at work had a guy in the front door with an M16. I didn't know because I didn't know better. I didn't know until I was 29 that my dad had a PhD. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, there's a lot of unknowns. But I do know he did, obviously, as I indicated, he did. He was the one of the lead engineers for calculating the trajectory for the lunar lander. I mean, they didn't know whether there was, you know, and I've only gotten this out of him in the later part of his life with liquor, but they didn't know whether the moon was six inches of, of sand or six feet. They could only guess at the gravitational pull. They had I mean, talk about brave. Those astronauts, you know, were basically told, we're guessing at half this shit that'll kill you. Yeah. Crazy. That is crazy. crazy. And he was doing this when you were, before you were born or? When I was just a very young man. So, you know, I was born in 64 and a lot of this was happening, you know, in the mid 60s into the late 60s. As I've been told and as I understand it, he's now... He then went from that to obviously the entire Cold War was the biggest part of his world. Lots of trips. He spent many months in Huntsville, Alabama, which is where that's the nerve center, if you will, of our nuclear and space program combination. Lovely place. He started, he did all the, he did all the, a lot of the work for years on the SALT 1 and SALT 2 treaties. And I mean, he just, he was just a... Well, one of our nation's first rocket scientists, literally. So, so the moment that we, the moment we landed on the moon, were, were you with him? So I was, I would have only been, you know, four years old or, you know, so it wasn't, I don't recall that event, but it was, mm. I recall, but I've certainly remembered the endless conversations at the table with my aunts and uncles over the event. Yeah, it was, that was a, you know, I always remember as a kid when that came up, how proud everybody was. That's amazing. I guess now that you have me thinking about it, that had an indelible impact uh, on my thinking. I mean, I guess I started reading the first Asimov or Heinlein book, Heinlein first, which is a famous science fiction writer. And then Asimov, which is the foundation, I mean, brilliant guys that were writing these books in the 50s, early, early 50s, and were giving, and these are highly educated individuals, giving their guesses as to how, what space travel was like and what tools were needed. And you wouldn't believe how accurate they actually were of things that weren't even invented until even in the last decade. I mean, their situational awareness before the invention of a computer of what AI would be, they were writing yeah. about in the 50s. Well, so how how did you, like, what was the intention with aeronautical engineering? I mean, obviously that was influenced by what your dad did, right? I, I was just trying, I did, again, I think it was more of wanting to make my dad proud, and but probably mm-hmm. knowing and I was always good in math, but probably knowing that I wasn't going to, that wasn't going to be the end game. I mean, when you don't have another, when you don't have an alternative role model, what do you do? <laughs> you seem to have a really good one as a backup. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I went, obviously I went into the direction of that, that our society drives everyone, which is where's the money. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I had, I I was always able to get, I was always, even as a kid, able to, no, I I knew how to earn money. I had, you know, I, they would only let you have one paper route. Like as a kid, as a 12 and 13 year old kid, I went and acquired, I went and got two of my buddies to apply for their own paper routes and I took them both. 
Wow. And I paid my little brother and some of his friends to wake up at five in the morning to, to do the folding. Um, hell, I think I bought a secret moped when I was 13 to help <laughs> run faster. You know, I've always, and again, then I, I've always been able to make money, right? So I, you know, from college, it, the first thing I did was I, like I said, I went into that switch gear system, which was interesting. And then suddenly I was in the oil and, you know, in the commodity business and then years later in the oil business. So it, it kind of fall, kind of creates its own trajectory, right? Well, I, I find it fascinating, the early stages of signs of an entrepreneur. Clearly, you displayed those early. And then you asked the question about nature versus nurture. You know, dad, did, did dad own his own business? Oh, no. God, no. He was, he said, he was, you know, a highly, a high paid engineer, which I think I earned, I think I earned more at age 20 than he did at any point in his career. But I mean, the, the interest in looking at the world in a way where you can take over more paper routes. You know, that's a very interesting thing. I mean, some people go sell candy at a profit or they'll, you know, whatever it might be, sell hot dogs at the beach, you know, where a starving crowd is, whatever it is. Um, and then you ask the nature versus nurture question. What do you ascribe to the outlook you had to, I mean, obviously money's a motivator, but what do you think were the early influences on you to look at the world in that way where you weren't going to do things in a sort of safe, you know, standardized way? I guess, you know, in putting it in, again, the, the, the hard part about retrospection is that you're using your today's brain to analyze what were, what you didn't have before that, that, that were your decisions. I, I probably simply so, it's just solution solving, right? I think that's one thing that uh, I certainly got a dose of from my father, which is logic, right? You know, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Right. So if you're in, in, in my mother gave me was have a heavy influence on me from a standpoint is I can accomplish anything I can imagine. Right. So I had a big dose of that. And of course, I was a nerd. I was an early nerd. I was the first one of any of my buddies to ever have a cell phone or a computer or an Internet or an email address, you know, with prodigy, if you even know what that is. <laughs> That came before AOL, you know, so I've always been a dreamer and I've always been goal oriented, right? So if the objective is to, you know, achieve X, Y, and Z, calculating and thinking about what it's going to take to get there is just part, you know, par for the course, as they say, right? It sounds like mom gave you that dose of optimism. Oh yeah. Mom was incredible. Yeah, she was. What was um, what, what, what's a core memory of her influence on you, just off the cuff? What really was a pivotal moment for you in her injecting that optimism into you? Wow. Well, I, I'm trying to think of some of the more dramatic ones. Well, I had a particular, you know, there were some events, accidents, as you will. I had a, a pretty nasty bike wreck and crushed my teeth and gave my entire face a beautiful, you know, kind of elephant man like scab, right? I mean, I, I crashed on a bike at about 40 miles an hour and used my face as a brake. It wasn't while you're running a paper route, right? No, it was actually at age 15. And I was actually I turned my head to look at a uh, at a guy on a super bike. That's when like the like when the ninjas came out. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at that as I was hopping a curb at high speed. <laughs> and so how did mom play into the optimism there? That it was gonna be all right. That you know, as any mother would, that you know, you're gonna you're gonna make it through this and and be stronger for it. Well you've got a beautiful face today, so the doctors must have worked their magic. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's, there's, you know, that whole doctor routine was certainly interesting. Um, you know, and of course, dealing with the archaic way of dealing with root canals back then versus how they deal with it today was sure something. Uh, a root canal mm. then was a two week process. Yeah, I don't want to talk about root canals. I have, <laughs> she, I have my own trauma. <laughs> no, but she was able during that downtime, there was a good, you know, couple weeks I didn't go to school just because it was too much pain. 
and spending that time with her. And that was a time at one point in time in our family when she had thrown away all the television. So there was no, not that we had a lot of channels to choose from. My God, now I'm making myself sound like I'm 80. Um, <laughs> two out, two, two week root canals <laughs> yes, for right. the moon, landed, moon right. landing. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, but there was, but we were able to spend, you know, countless hours together. And my mom was, would use that time for us to dream through different lives that were the option ahead of me. Well, you've seen a lot in this world. I mean, pre-mobile yeah. phone, pre-internet, your life spans a really interesting time frame. I'm not going to fast forward to the present quite yet, but with what's happening with AI and how it's impacting technology. You asked me earlier if I, you know, I don't talk to a lot of engineers. I just talk to a very specific type of engineers and they're typically software engineers. So they're not as as much as I'd like to talk to engineers who are more on the mechanical or electrical or civil end of things or aeronautical, which I find absolutely fascinating. The world I'm working in is just, I mean, software is eating the world. So that's primarily the audience I'm working with. But they all, there's still a similar thread through that whole thing of the way people think and approach life. Uh, yeah, there's a whole commentary there that our whole world has become so software, internet centric that we don't have we don't have nearly enough people that know how to actually build anything, fix anything. Yep. And the solution to our climate isn't going to be solved with software. It's going to be solved with hardware, physical, transformational machinery. Yeah, I've heard other leaders, like Elon Musk is one example, talk about that quite a bit, how yeah. there's a lack of innovation happening in the physical world. Yeah, no, I had, in fact, I had the very same conversation with Elon before he was Elon, before before he had rose petals in his toilet. <laughs> right. Okay. We'll try not to go on the tangent of Elon right now, but so to take us this, this early formative years, mom and dad's influence on you through to this paper route smashing your face at 15, <laughs> which sounds like it was probably around the time you started your aeration business. The transition from paper route to an aeration business. And aeration, I imagine, is that thing you push along people's lawns and it pulls out little corks of soil, correct? Is that, are correct. we talking about so, the same thing? So obviously my grandfather had a big influence on my life as well, but not till later. But, you know, we lived on a little nine hole golf course and it wasn't hard to see what happened after a lawn is aerated and fertilized, you know, it jumps to life. Like, you know, if you don't look at it for two days, but the before and after pictures are crazy, right? Hmm. So a buddy of mine who, you know, I had the paper routes, which was, I was growing very tired of, and this is at age 14 something. And he was mowing lawns on the weekends. So we got together in, I said, why don't we do aeration? And of course, the challenge was an aeration machine is was out of our reach, not so much financially, but by the fact that it's heavy enough that it has to be towed kind of from yeah. one location to the next. And certainly neither of us had a driver's license. So I did what I what I always thought to do, which is how do I cheat? Right. Which is go, how do I get, how do I find somebody to drive? How do I either get a license, which I couldn't get, or how do I find somebody that's going to be willing to work for a 14 year old or a 15 year old uh, and, and drive us around. Uh, and then on top of that, other people that we'd have to hire older that would do the work. But those things have a tendency to answer themselves. As soon as you have the courage to go into the breach Within a week, I had a college kid, which the, the university was just around the corner. He was an 18, I guess, 19 year old kid that, and again, he was older than me. He's not a kid, but he was willing to drive us around. And I, and my buddy and I bought a, a van. You, he, well, we used him. He bought it. We gave him the cash and we were paying him basically 50 bucks a day to every day we needed him to drive. So we, I guess maybe we started Uber. <laughs> Uh, wow. And, and well, then, then from there, we hired uh, we hired uh, day workers to start doing the work while we were at school, and we would sell on the weekends. And then we had sales crews. Before you knew it, I mean, I think at seventeen, before I went to college, I think we did forty. I think we did forty thousand 
a gross rev that summer. That's awesome. We didn't have a business license. We didn't pay any taxes. You know, I mean, uh, there's some, there were some mistakes made, obviously, but it was a good, it was a good experience. Careful. We don't know who's listening. Yeah. <laughs> we're past that timeline that they can go back. Yeah, I, think we're, I think the statute of limitations <laughs> well, well, well passed. Well, so, so this aeronautical engineering that you studied in school, and then it sounds like that's, there's some transition from that point in your life through to this switch equipment in the telecom space. Is that right? I just wanted to do, I was sick of school at that point and wanted to get some practical experience. And so that, I guess you would actually consider that as one of the first and only jobs I ever had where I actually had a boss. I was actually paid a salary. I went to try to sell the commodities firm the their new switch system, and the owner of that business basically bitch slapped me and said I had a higher calling and would make a lot more money uh, selling commodities uh, and currency trading. I'm a numbers guy, so I was able to I was able to see I was able to see into that pretty well. That's a pretty pivotal point in your yeah. life. That person's influence, exactly. yeah. By the way, that same company invented, I mean, quite literally invented Tony Robbins. So I got to spend a lot of time in uh, with Tony Robbins before he was Tony Robbins. Because they hired him to help the brokers? Correct. It was the very beginning of his career. And they, I think he was a salesman at one point, but he, but they always found him preaching sales techniques and psychological, you know, e- you know, ESL, you know, really kind of, kind of good stuff. And so they gave him that platform. And then of course he took off over time. What a trip. Yeah. That, we've got I mean, a couple that of guy, that, that guy's a total trip. In fact, he's like, he truly is six, seven. He's a humongous person and he's, mm-hmm. a, and he's, and on top of it, he's a close talker. His face is like like over the top of you in five inches from your face. It's really un- uncomfortable. Hopefully he has breath mints or really good breath. I don't remember bad right? I don't remember bad breath. I just remember pure terror at the size of this guy <laughs> lording over you. He has an aura, and I know you've met people like that. He has Oh sure. He has a power that you're that's unmistakable when you're there and when he's asking you questions. It's intense. Do you have any takeaways from that time, uh, Tony's influence on coming in and being so frequently in your presence? Yes, absolutely. So I started off in that company thinking I was going to do really well, and I didn't. And this company had the classic old school play, which is it will give you a draw of 500 whole dollars a month. And Mm -hmm. so you're either going to succeed or starve. And of course I was starving because of course I was still only 21 years old, I guess, at that point, pushing 22, you know, the money I made from aeration, you know, I spent that in school long ago. So I was, that was the first time I ever struggled. And that was actually the first time I ever had to call dad for a couple grand. And the last time actually I ever had to call anybody for money. And I was. Wait, you call people for money all the time, don't you? All lie. the time now. Well, maybe that's uh, that was the one time <laughs> I called dad, right? So where okay, you, had to I swallow, gotcha. where you had to swallow your pride and say, right. yeah, I, I need help. But that's uh, but then I had a breakthrough, and my breakthrough was to stop selling uh, people and instead educate and humor people. Have fun. Give them shit. You know, I mean, when we, when you get together with your buddies, what's the number one topic? Whatever. And the answer is whatever the apparent weakness is in any of your buddies. Oh yeah. Right. Like, like Roast, roasting each like, other. Yeah. I can't like a recent one that one of with some of my buddies, I can't believe a lot that you allowed your wife to, to force you to wear a dress on Halloween. Right. I mean, <laughs> right. It, Again, any opening shot you can at your buddies, you're going to take. And of course, you're going to remind them of that for a decade or more. Well, people like to do business with a, with who they know, like, and trust, right? So well, that's what it education, is. Education, humor. And we, and we make a decision on who we like and trust is all about feel. It's all about, yep. it's all about gut. It's all about an um, emotion. And I learned how to bring that and connect with people. 
And I like, and I like, of course, this is, there's two sides to this coin that we can end up talking about. You know, I like people. I trust people, right? So the flip side is I like sometimes the wrong people and I trust sometimes the wrong people, right? So Mm -hmm. your strength is also your weakness. And I've been very careful to do what I can not to lose my appreciation for people, but be smarter with respect of who, you know, who, how close I bring people into the inside and with what information. And that's through trial and error, right? The only way to really learn that. Actually more error than the trial. Yeah. Well, just like an entrepreneurship, nine out of 10 are going to fail typically of the ideas we all try to well, test like, out. Like we touched on the very beginning, we touched on optimism and pessimism, right? So every yep. decision, every plan that we write obviously is pure optimism. How we deal with the pessimism that follows either either from the outside or inside is really where the rubber meets the road, right? Attitude, outlook. Yeah. Yep. Well, and courage, right? To do what's hard yeah. or what's right. One of the things that I've had to face on multiple occasions in companies is in building these innovative companies, at some point in time, you know, you're going to run into somebody that says, I like what you do. I'll give you what you want, but I want you to kill everybody uh, before me. In other words, and this is a very traditional thing. So you build the company. It's time to scale. You have a valuation. You're struggling. You don't know how to make ends meet. You don't know where, you know, you're going to find the capital for three months into the future. And someone says, I'll give it to you, but we're going to, we're going to crush. You're going to give it to me at a completely different valuation. And we're going to crush all those guys that got you here. Why do you think that's a pattern? What, what, what does that outlook come from that makes them say that? Capitalism. Uh, it's just- In this example, is it because they already have, have a private equity sort of play where they leverage buyouts or whatever, where they bring in a whole new team? Well, the private equity guys do that. This is more at the shareholder level, which is they're saying, look, I don't care how you got here. You are where you are and you need my money. So therefore, this is the deal that I want. So it's a deal with the devil. Say the, the value of a company is $10 million. And right. you built the company with, you know, $4 million and, and, and you gave away 50% of the company for that $4 million. And now a new guy comes along and says, I'm going to give you the next $10 million, but I want 85% of the company. So that means that the original shareholders were just diluted from what they invested in. They now own one fifth of what they had the day before. Gotcha. And it's not okay. fair. It's And it happens all the time. On the private equity side, that also takes place where, where they come in and put in a new team. But I actually kind of believe in that more often than not, because the guys that, mm-hmm. uh, as I've learned, trial and error, as you called it, the guys that can start a company are oftentimes not capable of scaling it. Yeah. The tiers in my world typically look like, you know, it's often labeled by the venture capitalists that I work with most often. You know, we have like the zero to a million guys. We have guys and girls. <laughs> we have the sort of one to 10 and then the 10 to 50 people. It doesn't always fit in those brackets, but it's unfortunate from the perspective of somebody having to own really what their DNA allows them to provide in a capitalistic perspective on a business. Some people can go through all the stages, but it's far more rare than the norm. Yeah. No, I don't. I, unfortunately, I've had to replace a number of CEOs and founders just simply because they lost. Well, actually, it usually starts the same way. They start to become intimidated by what has to happen and the changes that are required and the demands on them. Um, Sure. And then they either go one or two directions. They either have the courage to admit their, their insecurity, their inability to answer the bell that's required, or they hide and circumnavigate around it, which is far more dangerous. Yeah. I'm not sure they even know that they're doing it, but they start sabotaging the enterprise and retarding it in order to keep them relevant. Yep. Yeah, I've been brought in to replace CEOs that have done the same thing, have had to replace the people that had to move into product or some other capacity. Not easy. 
Yeah. Um, let, let me take you back to this Tony Robbins thing. So the big takeaway from him was stop selling and start educating using humor. It was really more about don't buy what I'm selling you uh, by me. Let me be your friend. Do you not have, do you have too many of those already? Does that apply across all dimensions of your yes. history, yes. even up until the present day when it comes yes. to raising funds for Ecor? Is that, yes. does that still play out today? Yes, but it starts to become neutered a little bit on the institutional level because you're dealing with people that are not dealing with their own money. Right. Right. So they're, they could, they could give a shit. Right. If they give, if they gave more of a shit, then there would be a lot more advances taking place out there. Let me tell you, there would be a lot more happening, much, much more happening. Now there'd be lots of, there'd be more mistakes. There'd be more that didn't work, but there'd be a whole lot of, there'd be a whole lot more of, holy shit, it works. I mean, solar is a perfect example, right? So when I first started in solar in 2004, I mean, it was like seven, eight dollars per mm -hmm. watt. You know what it is today? Installed, like 60 cents. That could have happened. That could have happened a long time ago. It could have that could have taken place in the seventies as opposed to the two thousands. And what you're putting your finger on the, the, as a reason it didn't happen sooner is what exactly? Fear, right? Pushback from the incumbent, not wanting change, not wanting to lose his own relevance, right? That's the coal industry, the oil and gas industry, the utility not wanting to make a change, even though it's been the best thing that's ever happened to him. Let's go to that really quick, because I'm so curious as to, there was this moment where I think you said Ray Anderson had a big impact on you. But before that, you were doing this broker commodities situation where you got kind of sold into the fact that you could utilize your skills better in that capacity. And then it sounds like you spent a lot of time in this oil and gas world before Ray came along is what I yeah. understood. Yeah. And that changed the whole game for gambling instead of on, I guess, commodities, you began to gamble on the environment. Talk, talk us through that transition from the sort of the oil and gas days into this environmental angle. Wow. Well, Again, I've always been attracted to really smart people and you can, and I've always had a pretty good, uh, not perfect, but a good uh, lie detector, you know, of guys who were really actually really smart and those that were just good at pretending to be smart. And of course, a guy, the difference between a guy who's smart in words and a guy who's smart in actions. And to me, the difference between the two is the difference between a penny and a hundred dollar bill. It's easy to talk about the things that should be done. It's hard to actually do them. So Ray Anderson was a, it was an absolute visionary. I mean, arguably the first truly sustainable enterprise and first, and certainly the first circularly foundational enterprise. I mean, he became upset at the waste that his own product was creating and he changed it. He and the banks abandoned him. They almost, again, they tried to, they basically, the world tried to conspire to put him out of business simply because he wanted to do it a different way. And what he did was he came up with a way to make a carpet in a monophilic manner. In other words, it was one type of polyester. And then on top of that, he made squares as opposed to loomed, you know, 20 foot wide deal. He cut them into squares. That way, when something gets stained, then you don't replace the whole thing. You just replace the square or squares. It's got a bit of a Henry Ford to it, sounds like, in terms of just innovating the way things are well, being yes, done. But, yeah, but his motivation wasn't money. His motivation was to have a, a smaller environmental impact so that when yes. that square had to be replaced, it didn't go into a landfill. It came back to him where he was able to reprocess it. Now, did you directly interface with Ray? Yeah, no, I got, I was part of, as part of my history, I got, I, I was forced to start a brokerage firm and a broker dealer. And from there I had like five offices across the country. And we had a, then from there we had to have an RIA what to manage other people's money that, you know, wanted us to do that for them. 
you know, it had its own growth, right? So I was at a conference that in 1999, I guess, and at that point, uh, and into 2000, basically I was, they had an environmental little bend to it. There was a, you know, talking about the future of environmental technologies. I mean, it was early days and I happened to be picked to be one of the people that got to sit uh, at a particular table that had a particular, one of the speakers was Ray Anderson. So, you know, at a, I just got to spend a lunch with him, me and, you know, seven other or eight other people. And I got to sit literally right next to him. And I mean, the guy, what he was talking about, and he's a very, he was a very personable person, right? He was a, he's a good guy. Oh, and he turned, he, he turned me upside down. It was, it was cool. But I think I was also ready. I was looking for something. I, I was ready for change. I was not satisfied with oil and gas. In fact, the thing, the funny thing was, is what I was unsatisfied with was our, was its lack of sustainability, our inability mm. as a company. So I'm talking about financial sustainability. And again, one is the other, right? When you hit a well and you send everybody a big check and you send them big checks for a year and then the checks start to get really, get a lot smaller real fast. And people call up and say, why is my check smaller? And it's like, well, because there's less oil, because there's less pressure, because it's called depletion. And they go, yeah, but why is my check smaller? And it's like, oh, my God, no, it's too hard. And then all it does is force you to do more gambling. And after a couple of dry holes, you start to question, you know, is this really what we should be doing with capital? And that's when I met Ray and I made the huge change. Hmm virtually overnight to focus entirely on in environmental innovation. And what was the first pivot then? Was it to this hydro electro thing or was it something else? The first, the very, very first was now then going to conferences at that point that were focused on environmental innovation. Um, you know, we were pretty highly sought after because we would we had the ability to do about thirty million a year in in venture investments, um, and we were willing to gamble, right? So one of the first one of the first that we did was that I, that I really found some value in, and it still does today, and that is high volume electrolysis, um, which is one of the first labs that every engineer takes in school uh, or chemist or it's just one of the first chemistry labs, really. It's splitting water molecules, anode and cathode. And this company and these engineers I got to work with were able to figure out a way to do it in high volume and had the freedom of the derivative of how much anode, how much cathode water was produced. So you either had a, we had a three things. We had the, we had hydrogen. But we also had, based on the ch difference in, the, in, the, in electrodes and electro, in electrolytes, able to make a disinfectant uh, as well mm. as an emulsifier. And that had all kinds of crazy applications. Um, that was also the first time I came across a technology where it had literally unlimited uses was its attribute and its detriment was it had nearly unlimited uses which means it really required, you know, a form of focus that you had to pick something to champion, some avenue, because no one was going to do it for you. So we went into a disinfectant and fast forwarding through it, we were able to bring an entire Tyson plant to be salmonella free. Hmm. And they wouldn't buy it because it was a penny per pound. Which was, are you ready? Which was a thousand times more expensive than chlorine. Oh, wow. Which doesn't work. It's, huh. it, that was actually, I, I guess if we really kind of harped on, that was both a very positive experience, but also very negative. That was, that's when I realized that you could have, you could come up with alchemy um, and still no one mm. give a shit. Right. Okay. Th therein lies some of this pattern that you've seen across these different things that you've done. So just to go back a second, you said Tyson as in like a Tyson's food plant? Yeah. Chicken plant. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, so so you started to deploy capital in a more environmental gamble game, right? At that point, I don't know. At that point, I'm uh, 28 years old, and I'm standing in and I'm standing toe to toe with you know a general manager of a of a Tyson of a Tyson plant who doesn't want me there, who mm-hmm. who finds me a disruptive influence in his operation that his boss told you know, forced him to allow us to set up there. Is this at the, is this at the point of you trying to get, sell them the penny per pound versus yeah. the Clorox? Yeah. Okay. And we proved to them and to others that salmonella in, a, in, that, in an environment like that is airborne. And the, the sad part was that, uh, that no one cared. When I went back to Tyson uh, management, showed them and they had the results and they were equally non-pulsed. I said, well, wait a minute, as I understand it, you're not allowed to sell your chicken in Europe or even Russia because of its chlorine contamination. Wow. And they said, yeah. And I said, if you use this system, you'd be able to sell there. Yes. And you're ready for this. But that means that we would be admitting that our chicken was bad before. Oh, my God. Oh. Holy shit. Yeah, that was that was a real that was a real letdown. That was my first impact uh, at um at corporate negligence. So take me further into this environmental that was sort of the environmental pivot which I understand. And then you early on in this conversation you said that we you listed off a whole bunch of firsts, right? We don't need to obviously go through all of them, but I'm curious if you look over the course of time since that pivot, what are some of the most deeply meaningful successes? Because it sounds like this is an example of one that was just corporate negligence, as you say. What was sort of your big first win in the environmental pivot? Well, I, I believe it or not, that one ended up being kind of a win, even though we had to, again, do that pivot. We ended okay. up taking that company public. Um, it had a good run. The breakdown and ultimate death of that enterprise was greed when the largest shareholder in the company decided to try to drown out the company in order to take total control of it, um, which may have ultimately even worked out even in spite of him for the shareholders, but then he ended up dying. And I was not in a position to, uh, to save that entity. I had moved on. In other words, I had raised all the capital built the management team, ultimately had to fire the founders for their negligence, came in as CEO, interim, rebuilt the board, found the big investor who ultimately turned on everybody. And then, you know, I I found a a new CEO and I moved on. That was my gig at that time was to find, establish, start, fund, organize, and move on to the next. And that it's the move on to the next part that I started to realize was that, that I can't, right? That, that you've got to drive it from the beginning to the end, or at least do everything you can to ensure that every decision is based on driving it to the final proper conclusion for everybody involved, the shareholders first and employees and management team in alignment with them. Well, so some of these firsts that you've had, did you sort of find your personal sweet spot in terms of stage? It sounds like what I'm hearing, and I don't know the full history, obviously, but when some of these inventions or innovations happened and then they were commercialized, was that primarily the stage or were you experienced across the entire spectrum of... I've now become forced to be experienced across the entire spectrum. Uh, I like, I love the idea, and this is the reason for why there's so many VCs out there that are oh, they just want to be involved in the startup stages at the seed stage. Well, the reason is that's where all, there's nothing but candy canes and gumdrops at that stage. There's no trauma, there's no (laughs) ugliness and trauma, not like there comes later. So they want to get Mm -hmm. in, so they get a big piece of the pie, but they also have the opportunity to shape the culture and architecture of what's to come. Yeah, so you never actually get to fully leave them. You know, they're like your kids, you know, it's not like, you know, you have a kid and as soon as they're old enough to walk, you know, kick them out of the house. No, it, you, there's, 
you got to, you know, they, they have their own maturation process and every one of them seems to be different based on the people in the company. And more importantly, your timing with respect to market interest, acceptance and demand. So I, one of the, da- one of the things that's certainly been true in my career, I'm, I've always been way, way, way too early. Mm. I mean, the hydrogen production that we were able to achieve in 2003 is, has, I, I'm not sure that anybody is doing quite that much with electrolysis today. They probably are, but it's those findings, I promise you, that are allowing them to do that of what we did back then. And, you know, hydrogen is not a fair trade. You're spending more on electricity and you're inputting more energy then you're getting an energy equivalent of hydrogen on the other side. It's got a long ways to go, but I mean, that's how long it takes. And what, today the market's interested in hydrogen? If it was interested in hydrogen back then, that company would have killed it. But there was no interest well, J- in it back then. Well, Jay, when you, you know, if we look back from the where you are today, and I want to get into e just a moment, but if we look back over these, I think you said 11 companies taking them public, being the CEO of three of them, Obviously, you know, at some point becoming a dad and getting married and all that fun stuff. What are you going to be most proud of aside from the current operation that you're running? What stands out as, you know, maybe it's not one, maybe it's two or three different innovations, but what are you going to be the most proud of in terms of legacy looking back? Despite being early on on a lot of these. Right now, believe it or not, it's my kids. I've got two really smart, heavy on the common sense kids. And, you know, they're champions. And it's not just me. It's, you know, it's the wife is, we're both A types for the fact that we can actually Mm. live together is amazing. You know, but these two kids have had two, you know, A type personalities as influential elements and they've done, it looks like they've done pretty well with that. And they seem pretty well rounded and they're very happy as best as, as much as I know. And I think I could tell as a parent and I'm really proud of them. Uh, One of them actually there's a good tie in here to one of my real successes. And that's of course on the solar side. So a partner and I, you know, brought to the mainstream and, and, and built the world's first solar covered parking array. And we did that with Kyocera in 2005 and everybody copied us. And it was, it was one of those, a real success that was not a tangible financial success for the shareholders because everybody copied us. And it was one of my kids that really helped me enlighten me at to define success differently. In this case, it was one of my kids as a function of, it was my eldest and my eldest took a college course in high school on and she's just, she was just trying to get more college credits. And she figured, I'll take this environmental class because, hell, my dad's in that business. It'll be a piece of cake. And, of course, it wasn't. They had a good teacher. Made, made her bust her chops. But one of the things that they handed out in class was a kind of a innovation magazine. And in there was an article that she brought home um, that brought me to tears because of how proud she was uh, of me. Because the article mentioned that there were now more than 1 million solar covered parking arrays in operation. Talk about a surprising gift. And the attribution in her mind was she understood what dad had done. Look what you started. There's a tie in here with your father and his influence on you with the trajectory of the moon lander to oh, this. Yeah. It's so fast. It's so fascinating. Breach, breach into the unknown. You know, go for it. Figure it out along the way. In fact, I, in, in, on Ecor, when there was a particular existential, one of the many existential moments the company has survived and I had to step in as CEO, which was not planned. And everybody was scared and frightened. And I'll send this to you sometime. I had a very clever, one of our, one of our very, one of our many, very clever people 
actually helped, had some good film editing Kate skill sets. And he and I made a movie of Ecor, metaphorically, which was building an airplane as it was flying. It was pretty cool, right? And I was able to label it and have some fun with it. it but it, it is certainly accurate that I've, and again, I'm, I'm sure I'll look right now, I'm, since I'm still in the middle of battle, I don't have the same appreciation for what I've accomplished. And I've, and again, one of the things I, I know is a person I have to keep working on, which is to celebrate success. I get too yep. caught up in, in what's next. What do we got to do now? As opposed to stopping for a moment and celebrating, which I'm trying to get better at, but I'm a work in progress. So your biggest legacy is your kids. And it sounds like you've had some attribution from, it sounds like your daughter's schooling toward this solar array impact that you've had. Let's talk, we could talk about a lot of different things, but in, I'm curious to get into Ecor and the story of how, when did you join? What was going on before? And kind of walk me through just your journey. Early on, somebody in one of those environmental conferences hit a chord in me because remember I'm good with numbers. And so they started touting the amount of waste that is going into landfills. And you start calculating tons and then you are able to calculate calories or British thermal units or energy value, if you will of what you're sticking in the ground. In other words, you're burying it. And again, of course, you know, you know, if there's any landfill gas guys that hear this, they're going to say, yes, but we're capturing the gas. I mean, that's the equivalent of investing a million dollars for a penny. I mean, it's just silly, silly, silly. But no one wants it for hundreds of years. No one's wanted to deal with waste. And so the waste is always something that we've paid as a species. We've paid exorbitantly to somebody else to deal with. And of course, since they're overpaid for what they're doing, then they're just path of least resistance. Dig a hole, throw the shit in there. Has or send it on a, send it on a ship over to China. <laughs> Well, that's different. Now you're talking about more on the recycling side, right? So, Oh, sure, sure. Right. So, uh, and that's another thing that took place that was, you know, it, you know, if you find somebody desperate enough, they'll do anything, right? So on the waste side here, you know, they, and they've always, and again, everybody's always teased, but there's a reality to it. And that was that the mob was the one that was, that would deal with the waste. Hmm. And that was true. And they're, you know, they're not a mob so much today, but they still act like one with respect to driving legislation as to what we're supposed to do with our waste. Now they're being forced reluctantly to change as people are becoming more aware as a result of the internet, access to information, access to details, access to what's really right and what's wrong by math. Again, one of the great things somebody told me was that, and it's, again, it won't be the first time you've probably heard it, and that is just that numbers don't lie, people do. Mm -hmm. Okay? Well, the numbers are the numbers. And right now, globally, every second, we're cutting down the equivalent of three football fields of trees. That... Seven billion trees are being cut right now, and half of them end up in incineration or a landfill with, within a year and change. That's obscene. And when you start looking at, like, again, you could take a picture of the Dominican Republic. Right? You can see a dividing line between the two, which is like one is nude and the other one is rich. You know, India is the same way. They don't have a standing tree in that country, right? It's been denuded. And that's what's happening all over the place uh, in Brazil, in particular, as they're carving the rainforest. rainforest. You know, again, we're simply following there's a demand for materials and it has a price. 
and, and thankfully that price is changing um, as you start to calculate the value of CO2 uh, and the fact that the tree in and of itself is one of our best warriors for climate mitigation. It consumes CO2, right? And so, you know, ECOR happens to play very well in, in creating an alternative that is not an economic decision because we can do it at the same price as the giant embedded commodity. So you had this original idea, you saw this trend, you saw this need that we had. I saw, saw the value in it. I first tried to t- take advantage of it with another company in, and invented a gasification and pyrolysis uh, technology, which you'll be hearing a lot of in the next decade, not by me, but mm-hmm. there are by others that are in that very obvious pursuit, because that's a fair trade. I had always envisioned, and I'm not alone, it's just logic that you take the nasties in our waste, the nasty organics, human waste and other, and go ahead and turn that and convert that into energy. It's incredibly rich in energy. And yet right now, as an example, we have these massive ponds where we separate the human waste into liquids and solids. We clean the liquids and flush those into the ocean. We then take the solids and we spend a shit ton of money drying it out in order to pelletize it and then ship it to a landfill. No what way. What a joke. What a joke. What, I mean, how advanced is that? That's archaic. So I always thought use the gasification technology for the nasties to provide the energy necessary to convert the good and clean and reusable and recyclable fiber for everything else, for all your paper needs and wood-based needs. There's a lot of it. In fact, so much so that we'll never run out, right? Because it completely, it, 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 it allows itself to regenerate. Unfortunately, if the climate continues to turn worse and worse, then obviously biomass is going to pay the price, which means there'll be less. And then you start to reach a point of no return, right? And I'm motivated by these things. I'm, I like to think I make my decisions based on science and logic. And I'll tell you right now, we're in a heap of trouble. Big picture. So tell me, how does all of this come into a solution, a commercialized solution through ECOR? Well, ECOR is just one of many that have to mature. Right now, we're, ha- we're having success in teaching and educating Customers, in other words, large end users, guys that that buy hundreds of millions of dollars worth of wood or wood products a year and educating them because they're quite smart. They're very, they're highly sensitive to buying something that won't work, right? So they're very discerning. And so we started collaborating with them because they're reading the writing on the wall too. They have multiple objectives that are in that are in either competition or are working against other objectives, right? They want to make a shit ton of money, but they also want to be environmental and they don't know how to do both. And we happen, mm-hmm. to, be, we happen to be part of that bridge and through education have allowed them to participate in the material science with us and deliver them a product that is to their spec, not a little above, but right on it. So the spec in terms of the usage of the product, what about pricing? Well, pricing is pricing, right? Pricing costs, it, it, you know, it is what it is, Craig. So it costs what it costs, right? So how much is it going to cost you to fill your, if you had, I'm assuming you have an internal combustion engine, how much is it going to cost you to fill your car? How much is it going to cost you to heat your home this month? Well, it depends on Mm -hmm. how cold it gets, right? So you know, the cost is what the costs are. So the it costs are determined by input costs and what the margin desire is or what you can get away with, right? So the market is well established as to how much a piece of MDF or a composite panel or plywood costs. Mm-hmm. And we know what our input costs are to achieve that same product. That it's a function of of who's going to buy it and are they willing to pay that price for it. So 
we're now at that stage where we believe that the facilities we build in the future will not only be able to provide a higher performing product, but at a lower cost than, than the alternative, which is the traditional tree petroleum based byproduct. Composite. And so help me understand the formation of the company and the creation of the, the product. When did that, how long ago was that? It's, you've been in the market for a while through experimentation and testing, and now you have manufacturing plants. Can you get, give me sort of the history of the company there? Uh, well, we've had to do everything. So you start with the idea, you then figure out where you're going to get you know, some of that foundation. So we got it at the Forest Products Lab of the United States Department of Agriculture that had been working on a similar technology in order to provide income, an additional income source for farmers and foresters, which was how do you use your refuse more efficiently? Mm-hmm. So we took that technology, we worked with the lab, and as it started, you know, no one believed that you can make a high performing composite without a binder. In other words, without a glue yeah. and a glue is a petrochemical. It's a urea right. formaldehyde or an isocyanide. Nasty stuff, very toxic. And that's the acceptable. So we went from there and proved that we can do it. And then of course the market and the investors moved the goalposts. They said, well, that's great, but that only worked in the lab. It'll never work commercial. So then we had to man up and figure out how to build a commercial facility and we didn't have any money and so we fe- we followed the path of least resistance which is we had a swiss investor the fact she the first investor in the company was the president of akia america in that while so he was he believed in what we were doing as if as part of the future he's still involved today but he provided us an avenue and a neighbor of his, a friend of his, owned a piece of property in Serbia, of all places, that he was willing to trade for equity in the company. And with that, I was able to rally from them and their friends about a couple million dollars. And suddenly we were able to build our first small prototype, uh, you know, larger, much larger than a lab scale uh, facility. And that was the foundation of proving that we could do it uh, commercially. Of course, as soon as we proved it, the goalposts were moved again, that we had to prove that that we could find buyers for the product. And that kind of brought us into getting into enhanced collaborations, which of course all collapsed during COVID. And then we brought them back to life during the end of COVID. And from there, those very same collaborations are now uh, quite substantial contracts that we are now using to keep them from moving the goalposts to funding the facilities that will then meet the demand uh, of those large collaborative partners. And now we have all of their peers. Somehow we've been able to do all this without giving away any, any exclusivities by region and or product. So good stuff from that standpoint. And hopefully here in the coming weeks and months, we'll be provided with the kind of capital that's necessary to, you know, put this thing into a sustainable orbit. How about that for a tie-in? That's great. Yes, you're following in the footsteps of your father in a different capacity. I love it. Help me understand the types of base level materials that go into making these products. Well, if you look around you, starting with the table that you're undoubtedly sitting at, that you undoubtedly have your computer you're sitting on, as, as do I, it's probably an inch or a thicker tabletop with a laminate on the top, either a laminate, a veneer of actual wood, which is probably unlikely, but more than likely a, a melamine or a vinyl laminate. Yep. But underneath that, the real structure of it is about 90% virgin tree and 10% glue, resin. Hmm. When you're done using that, when it's time for you to replace that, you'll certainly probably give it to Goodwill or Amvets or somebody like that to take it. But 
at some point in time, it's going to end up in a landfill. The, you know, you can do the same thing with the floor you're standing on, the wall that, that, sur that surrounds you, the picture frame that holds the picture on the wall, the soffits above you and the carve outs for your lights and lamps and other architectural features or the baseboards uh, or the door itself, or you get the picture, it's all made from the same type of composites. In fact, the back of your chair is made of a composite. The seat of your chair is made of a composite. Your car is covered in on, behind the steel with composites in order as a sound dampening. It outlines the glove box or trunk of your car. It's again, it's, it's a commodity. It's used everywhere. And we've just come up with a way to make that same commodity out of just about any anything that isn't a tree, including the waste from the tree and the products that are made from trees. This sounds a little bit like your disinfectant story where you had to pick a path. Very much. So the, the same uh, analogy applies. Our greatest attribute is also our greatest detriment. So what we've done instead and what is that we've partnered with large enterprises in flooring, large enterprises in walls, large enterprises in tabletops um, and furniture, and allow them to expand their knowledge and comfort in using an alternative. So we solved the problem with the problem. Right. The circular economy. Yeah. No, but also the but we but th go one layer deeper, and that is is that instead of that being our problem, as far as what where are we going to focus, we made that the problem of the end user. Let them focus on what they know. Let them take that reign. Let them decide where the material goes. Well, what does a flooring company want? They want to sell floors, and they want to sell floors that they're not going to have to replace later from a warranty perspective. Mm -hmm. And they, and at the same time, that flooring company is under extreme pressure to lower their carbon footprint because some asshole above them, up above the chain in the command, the CEO or otherwise, has declared as have 700 of the top 900 largest companies in the world that they will be carbon neutral by 2030 or 2040 or 2050 which they have not a clue as to how they're going to get there. And now the pre every day the pressure goes up. They've painted them. Every one of them has painted themselves into a corner, which is they don't have a choice but to join the crowd of, of, of fighting, the, fighting the climate to become part of the climate mitigation. But they're only doing as much as they have to do, as much as their neighbor or their peer or their competitor is doing. And their competitors... Every one of them is fearful. Their competitors are doing more than they are, which will give them a competitive advantage. Because when you start adding in, if we truly believe that climate, that, that we're going to take climate mitigation seriously, that means we're going to take CO2 seriously. If we're going to take CO2 seriously, then we're going to take logistics and the cost of energy seriously, which means then by default, we're going to adopt a circular economy. And if we're going to adopt a circular economy, then we, that means that we're going to, that means every company is going to have a material resource plan, which, and if they're going to have a material resource plan, again, it defaults back to the circular economy, which means you're going to have to derive your needs from your local region. And hence, cellulose being a big mm. a predominant piece. So if you take everything from a mile around you, you're going to end up with a pile of rocks and stones. You're going to end up with a pile of steel, a pile of plastic, a pile of glass, and a absolute mountain of cellulose. And so we're just the, one of the larger parts of that equation. And not when I say us, I'm not referring to ECOR as much as I'm referring to just the basic conversion of cellulose and its abundance into a continued and valuable product. 
the biological loop. You know, so everybody knows the biological loop, right? The tree pulls nutrients from the ground. In the fall, the leaves fall. They rot. They decompose. It pushes nutrients into the soil that the thin tree absorbs in spring and grows a little bit larger as a result. Photosynthesis occurs. CO2 is consumed. Well, we're just applying that on a much grander scale. Well, not grander. That's that. There's a faux pas. <laughs> But on our, but on a, but on a commercial scale, how's that? So this localization, I mean, I want to ask you about the vision that you have for this and sort of what is it going to take to reach a tipping point? So this, the impact your company can have in the world. And again, if you do what you've done before, you're early, right? You've been early many times. What conditions have to come together to make this an incremental, uh, reality. Have you ever been in an accident? Not a serious one. Okay. But do you remember when you, the one you were in house, that was like slow motion? Sure. Like you saw it coming. Well, that's what all of this is for me, at least. It's like, I can see it, but it's like happening at such a slow pace. It's beyond frustrating. Right. And it isn't any one thing. It's a whole bunch of things that have to kind of come into alignment. So if you take the breadth of all my experience and all that innovation and all of that first, it's still the same combination of people, money, and time. And the time I'm talking about is the dedication, not only the time of dedication of the people, but you also have to have the right market time. There has to be enough energy out there for you, for the for the general ethos to want you to succeed for you to succeed. Right. So when we were touting the electric car in 2000, uh, you know, had just at that time had just stolen it from the guys who actually started the company. Right. He was just at the very early stages of realizing that, that he is the, he's the, he is the, he's the emperor in star Wars, right? He's the dark force and was plenty comfortable with that, mind you. But, no one believed it because it, it, it wasn't relative enough. And then the success of Tesla then forced a more rapid adoption and more and more acceptance. And like we started the call today, they're now trying to like bring back the fear of range anxiety in electric cars, which has totally been debunked of anybody that owns one. And now they're coming out with cars with a thousand mile range, right? Which is like, like only one out of every 50 people will drive a thousand miles in any one shot, um, you know, over the next year, it's crazy, but you know, back on, on the, you know, kind of everything, it's about timing and, and we're at that tipping point now. Like I give you an example, some examples of that. Have you seen that Apple commercial with mother nature? No, tell me about it. It's brilliant. I mean, it's very well done. I mean, they, they it spared no expense, you know, and Mother Nature is coming in to grade Apple. And so Tim Cook is in it and a number of the other major Apple players. And it's brilliant how they do it. But their whole answer to their whole answer to sustainability and zero emissions is by offsetting it by planting trees. So suddenly okay. now and Walmart's doing the same thing. Walmart's committed to planting 1 million trees per year. Right. Great. You're planting a sapling and replacing it with something that is being cut that lived for 100 years or 500 years, as sadly as the case may be. That's not equivalent. And that's, and, the, and again, it's now becoming a, so they're using it to camouflage their nastiness. But the funny part is they're creating, they're making the tree an icon of climate mitigation. Right. So anybody who cuts trees is therefore doing something less good, if not bad. So when people go to buy a home in the years to come, they're going to say, well, what's it made of? And, in, and every house right now is all made the same for the most part. Wood frame, cement foundation, fine. There's a whole a whole conversation to be had there, by the way. Wood right. frame, framing the whole thing. Every two feet, there's a two by four. 
Well, who the hell came up with that? <laughs> All right, and then you're gonna put, and then you're gonna put on the outside, you're gonna put a a panel, a, a what they call OSB, ordinated strand boards, the cheapest product they can find that's in a panel form that they then staple on top of all of those two by fours. And then they put a roof on it of the same shit. And then on the inside, we cover all the walls with gypsum, which is a whole other conversation to have. And then we fill the whole thing with more wood that we petrified with petrochemicals or putrefied, excuse me, petrified. I just made a new word. Again, that's because that's the way it's been done. That's the way we understand it. That's the way we package it so we can go to the bank to get the money so so that we can manage and mitigate potential risk of over cost expenditures to build the house in order to sell it at a specific price point. So all these things play a factor that you have to get every one of those to buy into substituting one thing for another. Right. And that's how we, and that's where we are. So the gaps that exist today to make this a more accelerated process, what do you see those to be? Money, just money. It, it's strictly a money issue. At this point, it's just money because the education is there. And when you infect one, you infect 10. We need the money for several things. One, we need the money to obviously build the team that's going to be capable of living up to the promises that have to be made with the commitments to the contracts the customer signs, right? Right. Customer says, yep. I want 1 million units of XYZ by Z date, right? right? So you need the people that are capable of helping you construct the facilities that are capable of delivering on that promise and commitment. You also need to provide them with what the market wants, which is, and we don't count this in any of our economics at this point, because I'm not willing to simply play the same game as everybody else, which is just to lie about it in a constructive way until you get caught um, or until you have time to, to come up with the right number. And that's the number on CO2 impact. So we need to launch that. That's another thing that'll take about a year. And it'll also take about a year to build a, a big facility. So we've now signed contracts that require us to build some pretty big facilities. And we need to, and these are good big companies with balance sheets. So, you know, it's surprising to us that we're having some, that we're having any challenge at all, but we are still first of its kind. And since mm. we haven't built a big facility, someone can always say you haven't built a big facility. And until you, and manage, you until you manage 300 tons per day, then you can't say you understand exactly what it's going to take to manage 300 tons per day. Who's willing to look at how many other companies manage 300 tons per day and how different is it really for us to do it in agricultural waste versus what they're doing today in forest virgin cutting the virgin trees right so it's again they have the benefit of history and infrastructure and we don't and the origination of the materials has been sorted out through the supply chain whereas yours are as predictable if you choose the right sources yes predictable right. enough in fact, in fact, yeah they, in fact the funny part is that the incumbents in every category industry have already established what all the standardization is. In other words, what, how do you differentiate one product from another? What are the tests, mm -hmm. protocols that, ha that they have to go through? What Building are the specs spec. in order to determine, yeah. in order for, for, for somebody to say, what are the specs, right? So when you go buy a car, they're going to tell you cylinders, horsepower, stopping distance, safety, third-party safety evaluation. What else? I don't know. Whatever in a panel, they're going to say, what's the modulus of rupture? What's the modulus of elasticity? What's the density? There's some very basic elements that we have to pass. The hard ones for us were swelling. In other words, how much water or moisture does it absorb? How does it react to fire? How does it react to UV? And of course, we've had to come up with solutions for all of that of which we have. 
in fact, better solutions, as it turns out, than the attributes that petrochemicals provide the incumbent. And again, there's a couple things coming into play here. One, the whole world um, is in love with software and the internet. So the whole world has designed itself around a asset light investment model. Right. The CapEx is a, probably a bit of a, a scare. Yeah. Even though our own, even though governments in Europe and here have put aside now more than $2 trillion to pay for the construction of sustainable projects like ours. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're the poster child for it. You'd think that there'd be a line out the door for people wanting to fund us. The fact, and I, I, you know what I bet? I bet there will be right when we don't need it. (laughs) Well, this one-year CO2 impact comment you made earlier, and then this sort of one-year timeline on a, a really big facility. Talk to me more about the CO2 impact as an angle to get more of a widespread adoption. Well, first of all, there's only two markets there's a you know there's a voluntary and and right. um, and Forced. voluntary markets. Only the European market is really active. California market is good, but less so. The right. European market, I last I looked, was about eighty nine, eighty six to eighty nine dollars per ton, and California was I think thirty one or thirty two, which is still awesome. That is fantastic. So if we are considered just the equivalent of recycling a ton of paper, which of course we're much, much more. If we were, if we are just a ton of paper and we have that in California as an example, well, let's just say in Europe, because that's just a, a, a sexier number, let's just call it $100 uh, per mm-hmm. ton. Well, that would mean that we would be being paid $30,000 per day just in current value. I'm sorry, $3,000 per day, just in current value of a ton of of recycled paper. But since we are actually not only preventing a ton of trees being cut, we're now also preventing a ton of agricultural waste from uh, basically a landfill incineration uh, uh, or just decomposition like compost, which creates methane. Uh, which is another greenhouse gas. Don't get me started on all the fact that CO2 is just one of a bunch of greenhouse gases and that we should be trading CO2 equivalent, not just CO2. But no, we should be based on the numbers and based on the fact that if we believe everybody is going to be, CO2 is going to be a valued component of future economics as a must, then we'll make more on CO2 at some point in time than we ever will selling the panels. That's incredible. Yeah, well, again, that's because you have 600, well, now 700 companies um, of 900 all trying to fit into the same elevator. So your, your demand is way greater than your supply. So when you take... CO2, and you say we can't have more than one and a half or two degrees increase in CO2, that means you put a finite number on the amount of new CO2 that can be injected, right? As soon as you have a finite number of what can be injected, you can break it down to the coffee cup. How many? Of what? Of where? From where? Everything is then easily calculated. So, you know, so I've seen some numbers that said that if 10% of humanity, which means 10% of every country, every government, every company, and every person actually was CO2 neutral, then the price of carbon would be $900 a ton. Wow. Yeah. So why this one-year time frame for the CO2 impact piece? Because it takes that long to do the math, and ours is particularly challenging because we're dealing with an agricultural crop, which has changes by season, changes by region, and different uses. Whereas everybody else is cheating, in a way. They're only doing phase one and phase two analysis which doesn't bring in circular. It doesn't bring into what happens at its end of life. So it's just, they call it cradle to gate. 
okay. as opposed to cradle, which is what we are, or the worst, cradle to grave, which, is, to what, grave. which yeah. is what most everything is. So this is a study of sorts. This yeah. is an impact study. Yeah. And it's currently underway. And there's no way to accelerate it because it just takes the time it takes. It and takes in the meantime, it takes the time it takes, and it take. And if you want it to go faster, you need then then you better have the quarters to plug in. And in the meantime, we're raising money to build a big facility. We're raising money to stay alive and uh, raise the money for a big facility and add to the team and do the carbon and so on. But going back to one thing you said, I think for our listeners. The, one of the really unique aspects of this product is it doesn't take as much glue or it's a certain way of aligning the fibers that it's as strong to spec without the sort of chemical piece to it, We've like the negative able, chemicals. We've been able to achieve the same performance characteristics of the traditional products without um, putrefying the material. In other words, the, our number one rule is add whatever is non-toxic is game. So we've tried lots of different additives in order to achieve other results. But no matter what, it must remain 100% recyclable, 100% non-toxic. And, be, and the reason is because our competition, our, the, the incumbent, the traditional manufacturer, are, those are the two exact things he can't say. He can't say it's not toxic because it's all toxic. It's all off-gassing and it's all nasty. The second thing he can't say is it's not recyclable as a result of the of its toxicity. He's screwed, just like the internal combustion engine. As soon as the as soon as the electric car, which it's on its way there now, is less expensive than the internal combustion engine, the internal combustion engine is dead. Just like coal, so is coal is dead. It'll take fifty years to kill it. Okay, but it is now on on its sunset, if you will, because it's now solar is now cheaper to manufacture and produce the energy than it is to mine coal and to burn it. That's even before yeah. you take into consideration the health uh, derivative impact. And so, for the layperson out there, like trying to imagine this facility pumping out this product, the beachhead, if you will, the most common lucrative use case for this is going to be flooring. I mean, it has a number of different ways to be able to build it for different we're getting, business cases. Yeah, we're but... getting most of the attraction on the two contract, the three contracts we've signed. So we've signed a, a beautiful contract for the use of the material in construction at Schiphol Airport, which uses the very same grasses they grow and have to harvest around their trade, their massive airport and trade park. So they have to harvest that in order to prevent bird strikes, but they have to grow it in order to prevent dust. Okay. So we use that grass to make the panels that they use in the airport for, for controlling construction, like hoarding, right? So they're like, you know, barriers. And now they're using it for kiosks and other uses. So that's on the construction side. Then we have Tarket which is one of the world's largest flooring companies that uh, worked with us for years to drill into the material science to deliver a product that they have now contracted for flooring. That's now attracted a whole host of other flooring entities. And we're still in stealth mode, right? So the, 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 the leaks are coming from Tarket, not from us. <laughs> okay. Huh? Which is fine. We're, we're okay with that now. And then we signed another big contract for secondary packaging. In other words, a product to replace, and I never thought we would do this, we're now replacing a product that a paper sheet is used for, but that paper sheet that is used by all the big beverage companies is coming from Asia and South America and provides them a very negative impact on their CO2 calculations. So by using ours, they win on the sustainability, but ours is much more durable. And so they'll get more uses out of it and we can sell it at the same price. So we've done that. So now we're getting packaging inputs and now we've got furniture inputs with another company that we're big distributor that we're now dealing with. So 
right now, if the universe treats us as it should, then we're going to be actively building multiple facilities over the course of the next couple of years. And within 10 years, there should be 50 facilities being built either by us or others. And I would say by 2035, every single municipality of any size globally will have some version of this, whether it's ours or someone or somebody who copies us or, or outsmarts us one way or another, it doesn't matter. Uh, resource scarcity is real and there, there will be conversion facilities for all the steel, for all the plastic, for all the cement, and of course the biomass in each region. It, there's just, there's no more efficient way than that. And so therefore it will win over time. I think that is an incredible vision for the future. That brought it home for me. I can't thank you enough for your tenacity and your passion and to see how all of the things that mom and dad instilled in you at this early age, all of the oil and gas experience that you had, all this material science experience that you've had, the, you know, being so early in so many different innovations. And then to think about the demand for building materials before we transition to start to kind of wrap this up, I want you to give me that stat because I've used it before and I don't want to misquote it, but there's a stat about building materials tied to the size of New York in terms of global demand. Because of the doubling of the middle class and population in general, that in order to house humanity, that by 2050, that everybody has a safe place to live. Of course, I think safe, you know, substitute your own definition there that we would have to build the equivalent of Manhattan every month going forward. So if you take, if just to put a picture around it, the size of Manhattan would have to be replicated every month for the next 36 years in order for that, in order for everybody in the world to have a roof over their head. Mind boggling. I can't even wrap my head around it. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 you are pointing at that as a solution. And the vision that you just shared, where every municipality we would be part yeah. of it, and, but also equally so will be will be the steel industry in coming up with better products that are obviously steels quite recyclable and very strong. So it's about light weighting. It's another big thing that you'll hear in the future, right? It's about taking out the amount of material required to achieve the same performance objective. Like an airplane wing. Why do we build a desktop different than an airplane wing, right? Simply because it's faster and cheaper to build it with more material than less. Well, mm -hmm. that just seems like a cop out. It's about just getting smarter. It's about using cement that might be that might be more recyclable than it is with less with less I'm not a cement expert but that has lighter weight less gravel I think is or aggregate that's required to to make it strong and making our buildings lighter so it uses less concrete uses less steel so on and so on it's just it, let's just get smarter for Christ's sakes and all these things have to occur in order for us to make it I hope that these things that you've shared today, especially here in this last few minutes, come to pass. I'm so grateful for this work that you're doing. I want to end with some questions that I, I think our listeners will really appreciate. And you had talked about raising money right now and having that tie to many facets, one of them being hiring the people, right? So when you think about your history as a CEO a uh, hiring manager in different capacities. I'm curious if you can share with us the biggest hiring mistake or horror story that you have ever heard or seen. And more specifically, what do you think should have been done differently? Well, the biggest horror story is careful who you bring on the inside, which I mentioned earlier, right? We brought in one of the companies, we brought somebody in that we brought in to be the president. And as soon as he was president, he want he his sights were set on CEO, and there was a weakness in that position. And as a function of that, he was able to start to organize basically a coup 
to take over the enterprise and ended up in a really, really nasty situation that I hope I, I never see anything like that again, because you know, it was poison. It was, it was, well, it was another existential event for that, you know, for that company. And I would say that it's better to take time. I also went through, I guess, another good one to share is with another company uh, where I had to remove the founder and CEO and his team because of some, well, bad decisions, for lack of a better word, but they were definitely tapping the till to their personal interests, which is just, that's horrible to find, right? That's already insult enough. So we hired a, we hired a firm and we had these guys, we had to replace the, one of the big shareholders was willing to put up the money for us to go through this. What he swore to was the only way to hire a CEO. I have to admit it, it was intense. So I was the interim CEO and board member of this enterprise. And so we went through, I mean, it was like we almost went through an intense interview ourselves just in order to provide Hunter what we were looking for and what we demanded, what we wanted versus desired. You know, we wanted to make sure he was educated. We wanted to make sure that we weren't so it was that we weren't so demanding that he was from that industry, right? So Anyway, we both picked the number one and number two, and it was clearly number one was way up here. Number two was a Mm. distant second, but second nonetheless, right? And so the process was to send these guys to this psychiatrist in Chicago, and he has a very specific program and platform. He has a short interview with them over the phone and gets, collects a bunch of information. And apparently, and I didn't go through this, I was only told about it, um, that he'll set up the waiting room with magazines and the like that he knows that you will at least glance at or your subconscious will register. He'll have particular pictures on the walls that will have, that will create other registrations. And then he does a deep dive, two days conversation interview with these people. So they have to sign up for this big whammy, right? And so as I was the CEO at the time, I was the one communicating with this psychiatrist, which I didn't find him to be that charming. But the comments from both the number one and the number two were quite strong in in that it was really intense and they kind of liked the process. So... The uh, doctor calls up and he says, I'll send you the report here in the next uh, day or so, but I wanted you to know that your number one is a psychopath and your number two is the guy you want to hire. What? How do you figure that? And he says, well, he says, uh, number one, he says he doesn't respect authority. He will respond quite aggressively and physically against it. He goes, but the number two is an absolute gem creative, constructive, you know, blah, 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 blah. So I'm the guy that I call the board, tell them that information. And they say, well, you know, you all call up the number one and let them know. And I said, why do I got to do it? And they said, well, you know, you're, you're the CEO. You're the one that started this. You're the one that has got to finish it. So I call the guy up and I tell him the news and like by script, He starts screaming that he's going to kill me, every family member I have, and will hunt down every board member and do the same. What? (laughs) Unbelievable. I I thought this was going to go a completely different direction. I did not expect (laughs) you to say that. He had already, we liked him so much, he had already put his house up for sale and sold it. He... I mean, it was like the perfect setup. So I could understand him being really upset. But to take it the lengths that he did was frightening. He ended up sending a letter to my home that was rather threatening, less so than the phone call. I didn't do anything with it. But then out of the blue, he called me three years later, calm as a cucumber, like nothing had ever happened, and asked for my whether I was interested in funding another company he was part of. In true, what, psychopathic <laughs> behavior? <laughs> I don't know. I can't. It was a renewable, it was a renewable or sustainable enterprise of some sort. It's bizarre. Um, That was really bizarre. 
All right. So what about the biggest hiring success story that you've ever heard or seen? I, I, again, the only ones I know are my own, and that is hiring Desmond uh, Wheatley for uh, Envision Solar, which is now Beam Global. Um, I brought him in. I tried to hire him for another company that didn't work out, but then we maintained uh, good relationships, and he's just absolutely brilliant and uh, even more of a uh, warrior than I am. I mean, he is something else, man. He's special. And uh, giving him the reins and control of that company has been a, has been a, a what a kind of impact do you think part. he's had? How do you quantify it? Well, he took the company from where it was and where I had been able to get him, and then take over from there. And the only reason I'm here is because he's there. <laughs> that's fantastic. All right. Well, shout out to him. That's that's awesome. No, that's a great, that's a great company with a great product. And no one's smart enough to have copied it. All right. So let's do some rapid fire questions here to wrap this up. So what's something that's happened to you in your life or career that few will believe? Oh, I, you know, showing up in Serbia in 2013, um, apparently one of the first American companies to show up there since prior to that, 10 years prior to that, we were bombing the shit out of mm -hmm. them for a decade. And how comfortable... Um, leery, but comfortable. Those people were, they're amazing. Those Serbians, absolutely amazing. Oh, I guess I can think of one. I got sent a limo, uh, to me to pick me up, which I accepted to go to Riverside, um, for a funding launch. They wanted my capital ability, right? Which was SpaceX at the time. Got to meet obviously Elon at that at that event. And it was a big heavy pitch to participate in that five hundred their first five hundred million dollar raise. Which like an idiot no. I didn't uh no, advance. <laughs> That's a horror story. Oh. oh well especially with my background yes. in this and your and, dad and my dad wow. and uh, I, I got. I guess I have to tell you, I was put off uh, a little bit by Elon. Even at that time, he was a bit ex ex mm. eccentric. And second, again, also, I guess maybe partially because of my dad and all he did with NASA and everything else, the idea of uh, SpaceX taking over for NASA was like, yeah, what are like, you kidding? That's not going to happen, right? Right. And, how, and, and being aware of how long it takes just to develop a rocket. Um, and the science behind it and knowing that science, I was like, this is a wet dream and uh, it's a disaster. And of course I yeah. couldn't be more wrong. And if people don't know, if people don't know, it's far more successful than even Tesla. Yeah. So Jay, let's transition a little bit here. Three to five things you're most passionate about outside of work. You've mentioned golf. What else? You mentioned your kids. My I, kids I knew that was coming. Still, okay. Again. Golf and kids. What else? Yeah, no, I, I, again, I, I, you know, I've had the benefit. My eldest is now at University of Utah, and I've traveled out there a couple of weekends to go to the big football games, which, you know, again, a, a number of your listeners have been to some of the, some big games and big universities. They go off. It's not, Southern California doesn't know Jack about that. She's there for business awesome. and she loves it. So yeah, having a good time. So that's one. My other girl's probably going to end up at either USC or UCLA. We'll see what happens there. But uh, yeah, the kids, golf, and, you know, outside of this work, God, I, you know, I'm not well balanced. But this is, <laughs> and this is, my function is to get this thing to its next stage. And that is start constructing these facilities. And that will allow me at that moment to do what I've done before, which is kind of reinvent myself for the next stage. Yeah. Amazing. What's your most exciting five-year crystal ball outcome look like for you? Not the world, for you. Obviously, you know, that's almost an NLP question. If you don't know that, look it up. Programming. Neuro linguistic yep. programming. It always ends up for, it, again, if people are honest, it always ends up at the same place, mm -hmm. which is freedom. And that's freedom from everything, freedom from of fear, freedom of, of uh, your financial uh, future, freedom of 
you know, fill in the blank, right? And I think if I if we do it right, and for me, I will have that freedom. Yes, but for me, and this might sound a little altruistic, but for me, and I don't know where this, what the root of this is, but I've had a group of people that continues to grow that have supported every crazy idea I've come up with. Now, they're all older, like I am, and, they, and the ones that are joining are certainly younger, but I keep finding people that, that, that take me for who I am and want to put fuel in my mm. tank, right? They want, to t- they want to make a bet on me, and that's overwhelming. And, but at the same time, it's a responsibility, right? It's, it's, these people are betting on me for their retirement. They're betting on me for their outcome, for their freedom. And I think the satisfaction of accomplishing that, as I did with one of the other companies, the feeling of that, irrespective of all the crazy, nasty, horrible shit that, that is in front of all of us, you know, the loss of a child to a loss of a parent to the, you know, theft of a, of a business to all the nasty stuff that exists out there, mm-hmm. war, all this nasty stuff. You take all of that and again, have something to balance it on the other side that can't be taken away from you. Sign me up. Hmm. Okay. If you could go back and tell yourself one thing early in your career, what would you say? Raise twice as much money and plan on taking twice as much Mm. time. What advice would you give to a brand new CEO who's just starting out? Raise twice as much money and plan on taking it twice as much time. (laughs) Okay. What advice would you offer to an emerging CEO? Don't double the same question. (laughs) What advice would you offer to an emerging CEO about building and leading a successful company? I would say stay true to your to how you got there. In other words, find a way to scale without loss of creativity. Huh. What advice would you give to an experienced CEO to help them continue to get ahead? Get more creative. You know that I always that you made me think of the mm-hmm. hero and the goat. If you know that story, so everybody starts off in a company wanting to be the hero. And as soon as they climb up there, they just don't want to be the goat. And the goat in this case, of course, is not greatest of all time. This case, it is, you don't want to be the one, you don't want to be the one that, that, that is blamed for the loss and or collapse and or bad news in a company, right? So what happens is that people will risk and do anything. They'll be quite creative as they climb and use that metaphorically, whether you're working in a company Mm -hmm. or starting one. And as you get larger, you start to take less risks for fear of failure. You know, the higher you climb, the the higher, the farther you have to fall. Stay creative. Don't ever get to that. Don't look, I guess it it is, you know, it is. Don't look down, just keep (laughs) climbing. What's your favorite book or piece of content maybe that has impacted your career and why? Doesn't have to be a book. You know, again, I'll, this will sound cheesy, but I always lo- I love the, you know, Zig Ziglar's mm. of the world. You know, the ones that were passionately optimistic. You know, and I, I have to say, I like I like a number of the of Collins's books. Jim Collins, you're talking about like good, like yeah. like like good to great. I mean, those are yes, that's a solid. But I'm trying to think of what's the what's one of the oldest books that somebody ever gave me. Think and Grow Rich. <laughs> They can grow rich. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Guessing it's like yeah. the most popular personal development book in existence. All right, what's your favorite tech? Oh, go ahead. I mean, I was going to say Napoleon Hill was. He's another. That's another mm. special person. What's your favorite tech tool and why? Favorite tech tool. And There's why? a lot of them coming out these days. Any good ones? 
Yeah, no, I guess I'm almost getting, I'm getting too old, right? I'm getting kind of old school. I like how, uh, I like how my iPhone, I like how my phone is sending me pictures from events that somehow it knows were of impact to me, you know, from a decade ago. Yeah. You know, suddenly, again, and maybe this is just AI at work, you know, as I told you, I lost my father on, fr- on, on Sunday and it sent me, the phone sent me a bunch of pictures, you know, 10 and 12 years old or over the last decade, I should say, of my dad and my little, little recommendation spooky. engine behind the scenes, somehow listening, <laughs> watching, observing. That is freaky and special all at once. Yeah, it's, yeah, and I don't know. I don't have really many other, I'm looking around my office at gadgets. I guess I can't imagine ever not having Zoom or Teams. I use a lot of that. I find that to be, I mean, holy shit. If I had that 20 years ago, <laughs> Well, Jay, you just made a comment that I don't want to skip over. And, you know, I want to point out the fact that you showed up after such a deeply uh, emotional event that's occurred in the last four days. We talked a lot about your dad today, not knowing that was going to be part of this plan. And uh, what a tribute to such an incredible man who's had an impact on all of our lives and has passed through to you the person that you are today, in addition to your mom and everything else that shaped you and your perspective on the world, what a tribute to your father. So my condolences and thanks for bringing that into this. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's part of life. When I put, when I just pulled up Napoleon Hill, I forgot. Again, his three most repeated quotes, great achievement is usually born of great sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Opportunity often comes disguised in the form of mis- misfortune or temporary mm-hmm. defeat. I mean, God, I mean, how do you top that? Anyway, should should you, anybody you know, have interest in learning more about ECOR or participating in our adventure, you know, reach out. How can they contact or find out uh, more about what you do? Can we give them the website? Well, I'm very proud. I'm very proud of our new website. It's very cool. It speaks to the heart of me and uh, what we're trying to accomplish. That's certainly one way. The other way, of course, is by phone or email, and that's jpotter at ecorglobal.com. No period, no nothing. J A Y P O T E R. Well, Jay, is there any final thoughts you want to leave with our listeners? I think the Napoleon Hill quotes were great. Anything else you want to say uh, as your final last words? Um, just- I would say in dealing with, I I can't imagine there's more many people out there who have had as much hand-to-hand combat as I've had. One-on-one conversations. I've dealt with quite literally dozens and dozens of headhunters. And I will say with the utmost conviction, Craig, you are special. You put more thought into what you do than most people I've met. You inspire me to think outside of the box, as you've done with this. Well, thank you. From a people perspective, a hiring and recruiting perspective, I think that's there's a deep curiosity that needs to be there. There is an outside the box and uh, unconventional approach that needs to be taken. And if you just follow the rules in recruiting, you're not going to really have the innovation. Just like in business, you have to take on as many outside perspectives as you can and I appreciate the alignment that we have in that regard. I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and letting me help you tell your story. I hope people are moved by the mission that you've taken on here and are inspired to take action to do something with the information, most notably from a funding perspective. This seems like a very good cause and you seem to be in a really great place to be able to have some magics happen. So I hope that you'll come back on the show in the future and get another update. And again, I can't I thank you enough for taking the time to be here today. And that's a wrap on this episode of the Bear Hug Experience. Thank you so much for joining us. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please give us a like, click, follow, or subscribe. We appreciate you taking a moment to give us a quick rating and a written review so we can continue to expand our reach and inspire the next generation of leaders to help make this world a better place. You can also contribute to the conversation around this specific episode by using the comments section or whatever platform you're on. 
And last but not least, if you have direct feedback, a question or a guest you'd like to suggest that we have on the show, please shoot us an email at podcast at bearhugrecruiting.com or visit bearhugrecruiting.com forward slash podcast. Thanks so much for listening and we look forward to having you join us again on another episode of the Bear Hug Experience. Whoa.